Welcome back to Ally Bullies TV, and today we have a very special guest in the building, Jordan Pittman with Exotic Borbles. What's going on, man? How you doing today? What's the deal, family? What's going on? <laughs> hey, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna just say, man, uh, I appreciate you coming on. You know, I know everybody got busy schedules and what have you. I appreciate you for being here. I also want to say, you know. I've been since since we touched base, you know, I've been kind of like following you and watching your uh YouTube channel, you know, for for people out there that don't know, you know, maybe you know the bully breeders, I know the borable breeders, they know, but you know, he got a YouTube channel, Exotic Borables on YouTube. Go check it out. You can learn a whole lot, man. He got a whole library of information on that channel, man. Go check it out. And it pertains to any breed, not just borbles. So go check it out. Thanks, bro. Yeah, appreciate that. Yep. I'm trying my just trying to do something, you know? Yeah. And give back to the dogs. Without the older dogs, I feel like the dogs give me so much. So, you know, that's my way of giving back, educate people so that they can treat their dogs really good and have great relationships with their dogs and take their dogs to the highest potential that they could possibly be and give people a better understanding of the relationship that they can have with their dogs. And, you know, there's so much value that we can get up out of our dogs. And I think people just overlook it because we're just going for the surface. We ain't getting deep. Right, 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 right. <clears throat> and, uh, you definitely get deep over there. It's, it's a term, man, I heard you say over there that I like, though, you know, from the nose to the toes. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> I like that, man. Kind of... Kind of explain, you know, to people from the nose to the toes what, what that mean when you're saying that, though. Yeah, it's like from the nails to the tail because with <sighs> everything, and we're looking at the total dog. You know, we're not just looking at just one aspect of the dog. We're looking at everything from that you can see and even what you can't see. So we're looking at the dog's his temperament, his abilities, his function. Is he giving you um, obedience? Is it purposeful? Does the dog run? I mean, it's just so much to a dog. You know, you got gun dogs, you got hunted dogs, you got bird dogs, you got fighting dogs, you got protection dogs, you got a lot of different dogs. And we just overlook, we just say, I want something to look a certain way, and we overlook what the dog can do. So, you know, when I'm looking at a dog, I'm looking at it from the top to the bottom, east to west, north, south. You know, I'm looking at everything. I want to look at the ancestors, the mama, the daddy, the brothers, the cousins. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out as much as I can about this dog and what does it bring to the table and how can I use this dog. And, you know, or should I use this? And should I include the dog? You feel me? So it's just a lot that goes into it. My considerations when I'm evaluating the dog, when I'm looking at the dog, and then I'm thinking about adding it to the program. What can it contribute to the breed? It's it's funny you just said. You know, you're looking at everything. You know, the mother, the father, the grandparents, the aunties, the uncles, the cousins. I didn't discuss this on the show a few times. For as like phenotype and genotype. What's your opinions on you know phenotype and genotype? So I'm always going to look at the dog this before my eyes first. So, you know, phenotype is what the dog is interacting with the environment. The genotype is the, the genetic makeup of the dog. So when you're looking at a dog, you know, part of it has to do with how you keep the dog, what you feed the dog, how much exercise the dog does, his lifestyle. Just like if you, you know, you exercise, you eat right, you're going to look, you're going to appear different, you know, based off your genetic makeup and the way that your genetics is interacting with the environment. So when you start talking about phenotype, that's the phenotype, the way that the genetics interact with the environment. So I got to be able to look at a per person's dog and I got to be able to say, OK, well, this dog is living primarily as a house pet. It spends a lot of time in the crate where it ain't doing as much active and in involved with the environment. So therefore, it looks a certain way. How would that dog look under my program, under my regime? And then I got to kind of like evaluate that based on that. You know, um, so you got to be able to understand ge genetically what's inside of your dog where does it come from and then secondly is the phenotype how does that genetics interact with the environment because remember these dogs is crafted by the environment so certain dogs based off of their geographical location going to look a certain way based off of what their task is okay yeah yeah um kind of kind of give the audience you know, and the people who may not be familiar with the Borbal breed, a little history on the origins of the Borbal breed. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. That's a really good one because the Borbal is like a lot of the, the uh, other molossers, you know, like the Connie Corso, it traveled with the, uh, or like the 
Europeans, um, you know, as the sellers sell the seven seas, this is like a, the, um, they had the Roman molossers. These dogs was the dog of war. These were the gladiator dogs, right? And these was the dogs that they probably, the dog is a, like been a, like a status symbol, right? So they carry these dogs. This is my dog. You know, he's a valor. He got armor and everything, right? So this is the dog that they took with them. And then they had the, you know, they was, uh, this was, um, you know, colonial times where they settled on the lands and then they slaughtering folks. You know what I'm saying? And they could be risk. They had risk of being slaughtered. So they got to have a dog with them everywhere that they went. You know, when they came to America, they brought the bulldogs. They brought the English, um, you know, mastiffs. When they went to every different area that they went to, then they settled. They had dogs with them. Dog been alongside man since before Christ. Right. So this is something that, you know, we just evolved alongside with the dog. So right. when they settled in South Africa, they had their own version of the Molosser and it was like the bull ambassador, you know, so they and then the way that this dog developed, you got the native South African dog. It's an Africanist. It's like a stray. And then they, they interbred with those dogs. They got a lot of different dogs, but it was it arrived out of purpose. You know, we um, have these certain predators that put us at risk. So they have like a hyena that this dog is equipped to deal with hyenas, baboons, lions, you know, certain, they, they capable of defense. And they look, this represent an obstacle to overcome when you happen to, if you're trying to get some goods, you're trying to prey on predator, you know, predators preying on the livestock, so on and so forth. So this dog has developed and arrived out of necessity, right? So in South Africa, you know, they say it's the lion hunter, but that's not as 100% true. Because if you think about a lion hunter, this dog is too big to actually be a hunter. It's more of a protector. It's more of a companion, right? It's like a self, a sense of security, like ADT. <clears throat> With right. the, um, so if you're talking about a hunter, if you look at a hunting dog, that's the Rhodesian Ridgeback. That's the hunting variety, the South African hunting variety of dog. Those dogs is very different. It's more agile. It's more alert. It's intelligent. It's decision decisive. Right, this dog is moving all around. He's tactical, you know what I'm saying? Because he got to be skilled. Right. And he got to be like, you know, very aware because you're talking about, you know, you're going up against some dangerous threats. So it's not necessarily a hunter. You got, you know, in every society have a hunting variety and it's got a protection variety. You see what I'm saying? So like, you know, we got hound dogs. We got a variety of hounds. Coon right. dog, trend walkers. You know what I'm saying? We got mass, we got dogs. Terriers. Got terriers. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? We using all the, and that's why I feel like we be overlooking the dog purpose. But I'm glad that you asked me that because the Borbo has a unique history and it goes back to the e dogs in Egypt. For real, is what I'm finding out. Okay. And they try to often discount, you know, the fact that they had those dogs was already there. And that's what I believe makes them really special because it has this um, dog that's the native to South Africa, that's a harsh climate. And it survived in the streets, the African Cadence dog. It's basically a stray. It's just a brown dog, like a dingo. Right. And this dog is intermixed with the borble. So what happens is now you got a borble with the, the mastiff, and you have this native uh dog that survived through it all, that's been, you know, going through everything that South African can throw at it and with in a harsh climate, rare, you know, doesn't have food, you know, it's surviving in the streets, right? But this dog is surviving without the intervention of the vet. You understand that they reproducing naturally. They re reproducing in the streets. They not getting no dog food, right? And they still very purposeful, you know? Um, so when you mixing that, when you breed that, it's kind of like the strongest, the survival of the fittest that kicked in. You know, that struggle, that dog is surviving the struggle and he have survived the struggle. He have proving that he have what it takes in order to be able to be successful in this type of atmosphere. So when you start talking about a dog like that and then you mix it in with the Mastiff, now you got a super dog. You see what I'm saying? Because the Mastiff have all these shortcomings. You know, the Mastiff have basically lost its purpose, its function. It's not able to um, run and do the things that it was originally designed to do. You know, it's not a defender, it's not a protector. Most Mastiff days, most Mastiff breeds. But when you got the South African Borbo, it's created, it's developed with this dog that come arrive out of the struggle. You see what I'm saying? So it have everything that it, it everything that it needs in order to survive. Right. And so that purpose, that gives it a different, like a little twist, you know, because the dog has have to be alert. 
You know, if you're surviving in the struggle, you know, you your your senses is all what your your senses is heightened, right? You have to have a uh, because you relying on your eyesight, you relying on your sound, you relying on your nose to survive. You see, you're not being coddled, you're not being um, supplemented all of these different ways, like a lot of these different pure breeds and today. And I think that's what makes the verbal robust and, and hardy. Uh, I was going to ask you, you know, what country the verbal come from, but you pretty much answered that. Uh, what what was the specific purpose or the job of the verbal, you know, when it was originally created, you know? So when the verbal was, when the verbal arrived in South Africa, when the verbal arrived in South Africa, you got to remember they settled in foreign, foreign territory, right? They're just like you pull up in, let's say you from, I don't know, where you from, bro? I'm from 105. Okay, let's say you come, you from the five, and you come down, you come across, you, you let's say you just, you head over to Kinsman, right, right? Right. You in a posse. Right. You like, man, you know what, man, I'm tired. Of, I can't, I'm not eating over there on the five. I'm finna settle over here on Kinsman. Right. And then people on Kinsman, like, hold on, yo. Y'all coming over here, now you imposing on me. You, you know what I'm saying? We trying to eat over here too. Right. And you like, no, nah, well, I got my dogs with me. I'm just going, um, I mean, they would just slaughter the village. You know, they might take out their knives and their guns and stuff, and they just like start gunning them down. Right. You know what I'm saying? Anybody that was a warrior, anybody that opposed them, anybody that has got in their way. So this is a risky lifestyle. And you have to have a, you know, you keep a dog with you because you need everything. You're you trying to survive. Right. You know what I'm saying? Everything, you're going to use everything, every resource that's available to you because you're trying to survive. And you and you settling in the native the territory, a foreign territory. So that's what the original dog was kind of like. These dogs was the protector because remember, I mean, you know, this is not necessarily peaceful adventures. You know what I'm saying? If anything run up, it's, it's over with. Right. We're going to, we slaughtering. We slaughtering if we have to. You know what I'm saying? And it's not like, we don't even think twice about it. We, we ready to slaughter. So this is like, this is the dog of war. It's a dog of war. But you have a, a, a more a peaceful, you know, aspect of the dog when you start talking about the native dog, because that dog was just trying to survive. It was trying to be an asset. It was just trying to, um, it was trying to win. You know, they're trying to, it's just trying to live. Yeah, and, and so you got these other dogs that arrive, you know, that intermixed and they bred the dogs and they said, well, this is a better dog. You know, so we'll use this dog. This dog is more purposeful. It, it serves our purpose. It's a better utility. It's a tool, so so to speak. And um, when you think about it like that, you know it makes this, it makes total sense for this dog to be, you know, robust and, right. and hardy. Okay. Um, how different is the borbo of today from the borbo of yesterday? That's a good question. So the breed is undergoing refinement. So I started in like 2006. And I can tell you this, the dogs that we have today is like a bigger, it's more of a refined, it's more of a, um, like a, a established, it's becoming a more established pure breed, right? So in the beginning, those dogs was kind of like still retain some of those varieties and you start to see, you know, um, the health decline, you're starting to see the smaller litter sizes. The dogs are the original dogs that I started. It was like 110, 130 pound females, 110 pound my first male. I did have a larger female, 160 pound female. But a lot of the dogs these days, those, you know, getting much bigger, more exaggerated features, you know, the bigger the head, bigger heads, um, bigger bones. And I don't think that that's necessarily 100% good for the dogs. Where is this? Where is this coming from? It's desired from the from the from the, from the selective breeding of it's, these certain dogs to get the bigger head, the more weight. Exactly. Yes, yeah, selective breeding. So we are looking at the dogs and we saying, okay, I like big heads. I like big chests. It's a very impressive appearance, right? So I'm gonna go for gravitate towards that, and then you gravitate towards it. So we all selecting the dog with the biggest head out of the litter. And then eventually we arrive at a larger size dog, but you know, more does not equal better. So sometimes what you do is you, you tip in the scales of balance in favor of an extreme. 
and you sacrifice on the other side. So you start to sacrifice the health, or you start to sacrifice the ability, uh, the workability, the function of the dog. And it makes the dog like basically that eventually we arrive at a useless dog in the, in the long term, like with the English master. Not to say that I don't like to down talk nobody else's breed. Right. You know what I'm saying? But you know how they don't have not retained their um, purpose. They're not still a functional guard dog. It's not an effective deterrent. I mean, you know, you see, if, you know, if you're a real dog, man, but I guess maybe for a person, the average person, it might be a defective deterrent. But if I see an English message, I mean, it's just the way that they move, the way that they walk. It doesn't give me that, um, it doesn't give me that impression like, okay, this dog is a threat. Correct me if I'm wrong. A, a, a dog that should be considered a working dog, it need not to be overweight, correct? Because it need to be able to move and function in a certain way. Like, you know, if a dog may be like 200 pounds, how much work can right. a dog do at 200 pounds? So that's a good question, too, because, you know, you what, what happened with the 200-pound dog, the 200-pound bull, everybody's thinking that it's the biggest, it's the baddest, it's the best, you know, because it's, it weighs more than your dog. Ate. We always put this value of, you know, we always trying to establish more, bigger, better, bigger, and better. And that's just the way that we think. And that's a problem. With, that's a big problem because bigger don't always equal better. And like you said, the dog should be retaining this function. So my goal with the Borbo is to breed towards something that is, you know, somewhere moderately larger size, but still retain the athleticism. I want a dog that can move out. I, I challenge, I champion a dog that can run. I feel like that's a very good test of his abilities and his health. You know, if the dog can perform, to, and then like, let's say if a dog did have bad hips, because this is one of the things that I get it, like it, it would never make sense to me. If the dog is still able to do all of the things that it was designed to do, then what difference does the hips make? They'll say that the dog have bad hips, but if my dog can still move 10, 20, 10 miles in a day in a short period of time, then I think that that is um, irrelevant, whether it had hips or elbows. So I, I challenge, I tend to breed towards dogs that is moderate. So like I take an extra large male and I breed them down to a female to try to find that perfect balance in between. Uh, <clears throat> I take the highly driven females, you know, the muscular stout dogs, and I put them with the males that, that's sometimes a little bit milder you know, like the main dog that I'm featuring right now is my big male. I got a big male that I've been knocking her down the shows with. And he doesn't um, necessarily have everything that I like in a dog. You know, like he lets other dogs mount him and jump on him. And he's like, cool. But that's the perfect show dog. And I'm not really a show dog. I advocate for a show dog because I feel like the show dog is being, you know, that's like um, everybody want to be a rapper. You know, that's like what's popular. You know what I'm saying? There's not necessarily no substance there in a show dog. So you got a dog that's this he can walk around the ring and he can't do much else other than that. You know what I'm saying? So right. my, my big show dog, you know, every time I pop out with the dog, he like bringing the oohs and ahs. He got the big head, the massive wrinkling, the big balls and stuff. But at the end of the day, the real dog that I'm looking, he's not the dog that I'm looking for. The dog that I'm looking for is a little bit, you know, have a little bit less of the exaggerations, more of the functional quality. You know, I need a dog that got some drive. I want a dog that can, that's looking up. You know, he's always, you know, on alert, you know, and he's moving his head. He's, I want a dog that's, that will hit something if it is required. Right. You see what I'm saying? But not necessarily looking to hit something all the time either. Right. You right, see what right. I'm saying? I want a dog that's kind of like, I like myself, I'm reserved. I'm not really looking for no squabble, but, and you know, I'm, capable of defense myself. Right, right, right. Speaking of what you were just saying as far as like, you know, uh, your show dog, the dog you like to bring out, is that the dog that I saw you with? Uh, I think you was just at a lefty's cheese steak oh, yeah. or whatever that was. Yeah, that's like my that's like my promo dog. I take him all the way. I mean, he's like a celebrity, you know? Everybody gravitates to him. He got a very impressive physique. He's big. He got a bunch of wrinkles and stuff. He got a massive bones. And, big muscles and stuff. So I pop out with him. That's my, um, like my demonstration dog. You know, he's welcoming, he's warm, he's cool with other dogs. 
you know, almost to a fault though. You know what I'm saying? Because it makes it like, man, I still like, just for me personally, just the type of person that I am, I want a dog with some uncle body. You know what I'm saying? So I don't really, that's my boy. Don't give it, don't get me wrong. He's everything, you know, that I would like. He's almost everything. Cause he just, I can't get over the fact that he let another dog mount him. You know what I'm saying? That's right. just, I can't get right, over that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right, 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 what right, kind right. of dog are you, bro? What kind of, you know what I'm saying? Like, this just ain't it. You know what I'm saying? Now, my dog I keep in my house is no a different the, story. Yeah, Balto, <laughs> when he comes over, he won't even look at my dog. You know what I'm saying? He a little dog. He like 120 something pounds, but he got go. He got gas. Right. He'll go 10 miles, you know what I'm saying? And back. He'll go five miles and back. I make him run, pull weights, he do the protection work, he versatile. And it's a utility breed. Right. You know what I'm saying? He can step out in the shows, he got confirmation. But you know, he's he's not the kind of dog that they're gonna champion. Right. How how important is that for you to get out, you know, with your dogs and be like an ambassador for the breed and let people, you know, see the dog and you talk to them, explain the breed and, and what have you. How important is that for you? Um it's kind of important because, you know, I, like the at the level that I done reached, you know, I feel like, you know, I done met, had so much success with the dogs. I feel like I just owe down to the, you know, like I don't want it to be a, a one sided relationship where I just take away from the dogs and just take the dogs and just use the dogs. So I feel like I, I owe, you know, they done given me so much and I really appreciate what they have done for me. You know, I done survived some tough times in my life where the dog was there for me, you know what I'm saying? And so I just feel like indebted to the dog. And I want people to honor their dogs and treat their dogs with respect that they deserve. You know what I'm saying? We type of overlook a dog or walk over, step over the dog, and the dog is there for you. If you, if you leave and come back in five minutes, he gonna act like you didn't miss you as a long lost best friend. And I mean, you know, you don't get that from people. You know what I'm saying? And that's something that I feel like society could benefit from. So I, that's just my way of, you know, just doing what I can for the breed, you know, putting on for the dogs, just like we put it on for our city. Right. You know what right. I'm saying? It made us who we are. Right, right. And, uh, you know, so it's you know, it's a Cleveland. We represent for the city, you feel me? Represent for the dog. I represent for my blood and like my family. You know, just uh, you know, just being part of who I am, being true to myself. Right, right. Yeah, I understand. I just when I see people out there like you getting out there with their dogs and advocating for whatever breed of dog that they got, you know, I, I, I appreciate it. I cheer it on. And, you know, I like to see people doing that, man. Thanks, bro. Um, can you kind of break down, you know, the breed standard for the verbal breed, such as maybe like height, weight, coat colors, what the temperament <laughs> should be, and, and et cetera, things of that nature. So the Burbo is a prominent imposing figure of strength. It's supposed to be big, it's supposed to be large, it's supposed to be very, um, you know, like the lines of symmetry, proportion, and balance. You know, it's not supposed to be already tall or already long. Everything's supposed to be in proportions. The standards is like a floating, though. It's open to interpretation. Okay. So that's the problem that I have with the standard because it's like, you know, um, you know, it's kind of like the law. Right. And sometimes we could people try to twist the law and make it work for them themselves, you know, like they argue against the law, argue cases and stuff. Right. And then it's just the interpretation of the law. Same thing with the standard. The standard well, the standard is like even more loosely interpreted than the law, because in the law, you got precedents where, the, you know, the, the other people that made a decision based off of this law before. Right. So in the standard, though, it's like open to the interpretation to this day. Right, so we don't have the precedent. So people could still debate it somewhat. Right, and especially when you're talking about in the heat of the moment, right? So we're talking about at the show, and the judge, you know, like, so the judge may not know the law to the T. You know, he may not, you got 260, 160 different breeds that he's supposed to know to the T. He's supposed to know the centimeters of the skull, how long is the stop, the definitions, you expect a human to not make mistakes with a breed standard, 160 different breeds. One judge is supposed right. to be able to cover all of that. And they're going to make mistakes. This was open to interpretation. It's, it's prone to error. Right. And that's my issue with the breed standard because it's not something that's clear cut. Where we can say, okay, this is exactly how it's supposed to be. 
And then we're talking about a visual appeal, a visual inspection, you know, versus based off of the appearance. And that's superficial. That's like a materialistic. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to make your decision the type of man I am off the way that I dress. I hope you don't. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because that's uh, deceptive. Right. You know, how a person dress. You know, appearance does mean a lot, but it don't mean everything. Right, right, right. Yeah, I get it. You could have somebody who got on uh, a pair of sweats from Walmart and somebody that got on a pair of sweats from Saks Fifth. And, you know, you got to go off the character of that person, not off the jogging pants. Yeah, I, yeah. I get it. Yeah, exactly. Because the pants coming off at the end of the night. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, what, what are some of the main health issues, you know, and concerns when it comes to the verbal breed? So the, with the board boy, I feel like a lot of it is obesity related because everybody trying to stick out this big dog. Everybody trying to put weight on their dog fast. So you're going to get dogs that's just overweight. They can't grieve. They can't hardly move. And I think that's the biggest issue I see. Um, most of the dogs that I, so I do this thing where I take the dogs out in the pack and I'm moving them all as a pack. And a lot of times when people bring in their dogs, sometimes they bring in a pet and they want to roll with the pack. And the pet just is overweight. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. They can't even get started because they got to poop three, four times to get the, you know what I'm saying? He said, your dog is surviving as a pet, right? So my dog is earning they keep. They got to earn every meal. You know what I'm saying? And they going to go, go, go it out. And right. I need to be seeing, I need to be seeing obedience. You know, I need to be seeing that you up and that your spirit is woke, that you was on your job. You know what I'm saying? You earn your keep for me. And so, um, meals is few, far in between, and we moving them around. You know, what I'm saying? so my dogs is like on the hunt when we get out there, right, and right. It, and I feel like obesity because they have that they have that hunger. You know, what I'm saying they have that uh, instinctual drive to survive. They're looking for food, like what I gotta do to get some child around here. Right. You know, what I'm saying they right. ready to hunt. <laughs> right. You see what I'm saying, and, and, and because of that, they maintain their fitness, their agileness, their athleticism. When you got this overly obese dog and then you bringing them in and you know that's okay for a pet you understand but when i'm talking about i'm running a program i'm running a program so i see a lot of dogs people putting the weight on them they that can't justify the weight you know like that's different if you you know okay ryan garcia last night hang me 143 he was able to knock down haney he that's justified weight you know he right. had an extra couple pounds on him Gave him a couple of extra power, and he was able to accomplish the mission. Now, if he got 146 pounds and he moving slow and he ain't able, he running out of gas, then it's a detriment. That's detrimental to this desired effect. He trying to win. We trying to run. We trying to get to the next meal. You know what I'm saying? So we have to be fit. We got to maintain our fitness. And now you don't ever want to get caught slipping, right? So you want to maintain your, you know, you got to stay in shape. And people just letting their dogs, they don't have no expectation for their dogs. And I feel like obesity related. I, when I run dogs in there, they start to fall behind. Sometimes, you know, I'm going to disclude them. I'm going to just, just, that's like, I'm cutting you from the, you cut. Right. You ain't making a cut if you can't keep up. And we not, with the, with the chairman say, he, we, we not being ruthless no more. You know? Okay. Um. What are what are some things that would be considered a flaw or a fault when it pertains to the verbal breed when you're looking over a dog? For me, it's a little head with a male, for sure. I do not like <laughs> <laughs> for sure. If your dog got a your male, he got to have a big head, for real. For me to find value, I mean that's just something I can't do with no males with a small head. I just can't do it. And uh, then I'm gonna I'm I'm say this too. I like a I like a nice refined petite female. I like petite females. You know, it's not something that just she could be. She could have all of the traits and stuff like you know, big head, head, but it's got to be proportion, right? I don't. I want. I want. I still want a bitch that can move. I like. I, I want a bitch with some instinct, yeah, and um, not just big and sloppy. That's the problem for me. That like. That, that oversized stuff. I want a small female and I like a nice representative of male that represent power and strength. I want you to look at my dog and stop and take a take a second and then 
like shit, you know, you want right. a second, you know what I'm saying? Right, think about it, like, should I approach yeah. <laughs> should yeah, I right. come over there? Or, right. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. yeah, not just, I don't like, you know, the dog's supposed to be on his job. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? And, and when they get too big, they just seem to get relaxed, too relaxed for me. Okay, um, out of the many breeds of dogs, you know, that exist, what is it about the Orbel that made you not only want to breed it, but also had this breed of dog as like a pet and companion as well? So I started out with the Connie Corsos and the Connie Corsos um, was just, the market was flooded with Connie Corsos. Everybody had it. And I feel like uh, it was too many different styles and varieties of the Corso. You had some that was like, this, this, when I started, I mean, it was just getting into the Italian versus the American, where the Italian was was looking more boxerish, and then the American ones was bigger and stuff. You got Scandifio is in Youngstown, Ohio. He's a big timer, and it's like it wasn't no really. I didn't think that it was enough space for me. Then when I brought in my Borbo, it's like whoa, the Borbo was a totally totally. So I was feeding my dogs raw. I'm feeding the. the I had some Corso puppies. They was a little older. And I put down the raw and I bring out my Borbo puppy and he's snatching them around. You know, he was a cool dog. He was cool. But when I put that raw down, he was like moving dogs out the way, shaking them, you know what I'm saying? Tossing them left and right. And he, he asserted himself. And I was like, yeah, this is a different type of dog. Everybody would come and visit. And they'd be like, man, what's that right there? I wouldn't tell them. I'm like, that's just a, uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what what is the you know I know people make their different prices of dogs different kennels things like that they got different pricing but what is the average cost of a warble? Uh, the average cost of a warble is probably about thirty five three thousand right now twenty five three thousand right now I feel like the warble should be though uh, you know right up there with the bullies and you know I respect a lot of what's going on with the bully breed and um, you know the way that they. Promote the, the dog. marketing. The yeah. marketing is that's that's what they got understood, and I think that that's what's the failing of the Borbo and a lot of different of the larger dog breeds is they not average. They not marketing the dogs because remember this whole concept of purebred dog is a commercial concept. It's not a scientific concept. It's a commercial. It's based off of if there is no amount of generation that you can look up and say this is scientifically. Now, at this point, it's established as a purebred dog. That's a commercial concept. That's derived out of market, right? So we'll say, okay, yeah, my dog is breeding true to type, and I'll get on a campaign, and I'll start to say, yo, I got this dog, and this is what it's able to do, and I'm able to reproduce this consistently. And now I'm establishing this is as a pure breed, right? I done wrote a standard. Me and my dudes, we wrote a standard. We got together, me and the posse, and we sat down and had a meeting. And we looked at our dogs and we said, this is what I like about my dog. This is what I like. And I'm going to write this into the standard. And this is the way that it should be. It's not necessarily justified based off of, okay, I'm, I need a dog that can fit inside of a 14-inch hole because the typical hole of a groundhog is this size. Or I need a dog to be able to navigate through the, through the high weeds in the brush. So I need them to have thick legs. I need the legs to be a mandatory minimum of this size. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, not all, it's all for marketing. To, to, you know, to a point for us, like, you know, with paperwork, you could you could sell a dog with paperwork and that dog is valued at, to be more money than the dog without the paperwork. Right, right, exactly, yeah. So that's that's part of it because, okay, so, but people not understanding what is the weight of the paperwork. Why is the paperwork value? What makes the paperwork value? The paperwork is establishes a lineage. Right. Right, the paperwork is a document, a recorded document that may have all of its accolades. So you might have your, you know, you get canine good citizen, your best in show, you know, your shut son, eighty, your IPO, whatever ratings that's associated with the dog. And then you're able to retract and then you're able to identify these traits as they're being passed on to the next generation, so on and so forth. That's the value of having a pedigree, right? But you still cannot overlook the dog in front of your face. Right. And see, so, so people, I feel like a lot of times people be chasing pedigrees and stuff. They don't really understand you know, the true value of the, the, the true value is the dog that's before your eyes, not something was written down on the paper because the paperwork, I learned this very early in the game, the papers really is only, you know, it's, it's only, papers is 
People, people create papers all the time. That's what I was going to say, especially when people lie and hang papers and it's dogs in that pedigree. If you're looking at that pedigree, if you're a person that's just clearly going off the paperwork and you're looking at that pedigree, it could be two, three, four, five, six dogs somewhere up in there that ain't even supposed to be there. Another dog supposed to be there. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, like, and then, and then, and, you know, um, just being fair to humans, it's also prone to human error. So people can make mistakes. You know, we don't always want to like put people in a bad space and say that they always, sometimes people make mistakes, right? honest mistakes. So when you start talking about a pedigree, I mean, you just got to look and then you got to remember this too, man. Dogs are rich to have a um, purpose. So like a lot of dogs should not have been written. And I don't like to really like, cause I respect the bully kill. No disrespect to the bully community, but because they have created some fantastic dogs, you know, like experiment. I mean, it's there's a right. phenomenal what they're able to do. But at the same time, a lot of the, if you're talking about the original pit bull, the real game dog, the real bull dog, then that is like, um, how do you get to this this bully from the pit bull? You know what I'm saying? Those were curs. Those was curs. You're talking about these are the dogs that they had selected, they gave away. And then people took them and started breeding them and making them into pets. And then they started adding stuff in there and mixing stuff in there. And they would they didn't ever say, This this something totally, this is not a this is not a bulldog, this is not a gang dog. Those dogs was they, those was curs, those was cubs. They was released, they was not meant to be bred. And then when people done took them and made them not. They just wasn't desired for. They wasn't desired for their original purpose, and then they then took them and made them into a breed that really is only de a, a designed to just appear to right. be able to do a perform. But even from a companionship perspective, you know the bullies just fought. I mean, I don't want to like rag on the bullies because I, I respect the game. But bullies is falling apart. You know what I'm saying? You got dogs that people will, walking them around in baby cribs and wagons and stuff. You know what I'm saying? The dog can't even walk. You got to walk it up to the and then carry it up the stairs. You see what I'm saying? It's funny you say that. I, I was gonna I was gonna ask you this because I heard I heard you all discussing this on one of your shows. Not to not about bullies, but I heard this topic come up on your show. As far as like you know. Do you think, you know, people is doing these breeds a disservice by like far as like, you know, with a lot of with the bullies and like the smaller French bulldogs, they not allowing these dogs to, you know, naturally reproduce and they not allowing these dogs to, you know, naturally call like far as like out in the wild and things like that. Certain dogs would not make it. Certain dogs would not survive and be able to go on and then continue to breed and pass them health issues and them, 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 the temperament of what they were on to further offspring and people just keep breeding and breeding. Yeah, it's a big problem. It definitely is a big problem. So you got um, natural selection and then you got artificial selection, right? And so what we doing with the, with the breedings um, like in purebred dogs, trying to establish pure breeds, trying to establish type. You are, are um, <clears throat> let's say, you know, you locking dogs in, breeding dogs within a certain gene pool, certain bloodline. And what you're seeking out is actually morphs. You're seeking out actually mutations, right? So you're looking at uh, sometimes when you arrive at a mutation in the wild and a natural uh, selection environment, the mutation actually provides a benefit so it, it you know it might give the dog a l additional wind capacity or it might give the dog additional heat tolerance for or, the environment that he that he in he mutating for the environment that he in so that it can survive exactly exactly that's natural right but what we're seeking now is a visual appeal so we're looking from our eye like oh his chest big, but that doesn't necessarily mean he can box. You see what I'm saying? Ooh, ooh, he tall, he tall, but that don't necessarily mean he can ball. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's thick, it's thick, it's thick. 
Oh, I like that. But that don't mean it can hit. You see what I'm saying? Just because you tall don't mean you can ball. It's not mean you're gonna bit, 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 mean you're gonna be a basketball player, right? So that is the problem that we we not evaluating or assessing. We, it, everybody is, 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 and that's the problem with these shows too. You know, what I see the the because don't get me wrong, man. I got mad respect for the bully community and the shows and everything that they've been able to do. Like it's mad respect. But I feel like I still want to learn from their mistakes. So I see people, you know, a lot of people jockeying and then they popping and talking and, you know what I'm saying, my dog this, yeah, 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 this. But there is no really way to prove that. You know, it's all about, okay, I look, yeah, your dog look good, my dog look good. Okay, now what do we do? We can't run, like, okay, let's have a let's have a contest. You know what I'm saying? We should have a visual, we should have a, a measure where your dog should be able to run a certain, that's my thing running a certain distance a lot of those i feel like it's they can't even run they can't even run or some of them can't even walk right so you don't have a dog to me you got an ornament you got like a goldfish you know what i'm saying for real <laughs> it's not a dog it's, it ain't no dog that's not a dog you gotta walk, 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 walk him in the wagon you know what i'm saying right right you know, a, a lot of times, you know, it's just a shout match. Like you said, my dog, my dog this, my dog that. And it's two, three, four, five people just having a shout match. But they're not actually letting the dogs compete. Yeah. Yeah. Let Physically. Your, let your dog show and prove. You know what I'm saying? Let's see what he can do. You know what I'm saying? People be done took your dog and your dog don't. I mean, you know, I, I have seen it. Oh, I have, you know, I rock with bully breeders. A lot of bully breeders is coming over to the board. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, man, this dude, you know, I'm pulling up, dropping off some dogs. He's got a Frenchies. And uh, the Frenchie came out and got loose. I got to throw my dog in the truck. And I picked his dog up. Like, hey, man, your dog is out here loose. You know what I'm saying? Did you right. know that? I got the dog and I'm walking it like it's my dog. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, man, come on, man. What's, it's funny to me. Right, you know right, what I'm right. Saying? Yeah, yeah. I like a bigger dog on myself, too, though. Yeah, a dog that's going to leash, you know, like I said, when you see it, you're going to want to hold on. And the dog going to show some, you know, get back, you know. Yeah, yeah, it should it should make you apprehensive. Like, hold on, you should start second guessing and thinking if you got bad intentions, especially. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's what a dog's supposed to do. It's supposed to provide a layer. In my opinion, you know, for what I need, need in my lifestyle, a dog, I need a layer of security, some extra eyes and ears and the nose. I am here, man. I yeah. agree. Uh, what are some of the things you know you would go over with a first time horrible owner? Like if I if I wanted to come to you right now and be like, you know, I'm thinking about getting into the horrible breed. I'm thinking about you know purchasing a puppy from you. What's some of the things you know you might want to go over with me? Well, you know, I talk about experience. You know, a lot of um with. You're going to benefit and with the dogs with a borble is observation. So you need to be able to like you read your dog, how is the dog going to respond in a certain different environmental stimulations? And you know, you want to be able to communicate with your dog, establish a bond. So it's not about, you know, how good of a dog trainer that you are. Are you committed in, are you vested in the dog, the dog, the human relationship? You know, are you willing to commit? You know, like I got my dogs out in the truck. You know what I'm saying? They gonna well, when we leave here, we're gonna go hang out for a bit. You know what I'm saying? And then and, you know, that's just two of them. But you know, every dog deserved that at some point. You know what I'm saying? And uh, before I left, I was invested with my dogs, just spending time, making sure that they fed and everything. You know, not they ain't like I'm gonna be here all day long, but I still, you know, make the dogs a priority. And then I feel like you, if you're not willing to do that, you're not gonna reach your greatest potential with the dog. You might end up having a headache. You know what I'm saying? Because this dog is not the type of dog that's gonna just sit up in the crate and be comfortable like that. They got to get out. They got to in in it's a real dog. So and they got power. So he coming up out that crate. You know what I'm saying? He, right. he ain't built for him. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh... You know, I believe I heard you speak on this this before, uh, so I thought, you know, it would be a great subject if I brought it up for the viewers out there. Why do you think, you know, it's important for a female dog 
you know, to preserve her feminine femininity and and not be too masculine, you know, like how how important is that? That's extremely important. That's extremely important because what you're looking for in a mom is fertility and maternal instincts. You need a bitch that's going to raise your puppies with care. You know, you want a bitch that's going to be mindful, of care, you know, like careful, gentle when she re, re the nest. You know, you letting that bitch out, she come back in. You don't want this butch at, you know, this butch female coming in. She laying down, plopping down on the puppies. You know what I'm saying? She's, uh, she can't have a, a successful litter because the dog's puppy's heads is too big. You know what I'm saying? She's not producing a whole lot of milk. You know what I'm saying? Because her hormones and stuff is imbalanced. So she got more testosterone than she do progesterone. So she's producing, you know, a very little milk. She right. doesn't have the maternal instinct. She's not um, mindful of her puppies. She's not cleaning them up. You know what I'm saying? So when you that's that's what a feminine dog, a feminine female, you know, they have a large litters. They don't they don't necessarily look. They're not the biggest, and they don't necessarily carry the extreme exaggerations that you make. You say, "Oh man!" But see, that's what I'm looking for in the male. I'm looking for my male to be strong and powerful and posing. I'm looking for my male to have that warrior look. I want the, my male to look like you know he's ready to take care of business. I'm not necessarily requiring that from a few minutes. Like I'm not looking for my wife to go check and see what was that noise. You see what I'm saying? Or she ain't. I ain't looking for her to none of the girls to step up and right, you know right. what I'm saying be initiating contact or you know engaging in combat. Right. So it is just the natural way. Females supposed to be refined, feminine, and um, natural, maternal, nurturing, caring, and that's just. Uh, I think that goes along with the hormones. You know, I just thought I'd bring that up for, for, you know, the viewers, but also the bully viewers, because, you know, a lot of times you hear them saying, oh, I've got this she-male, look at this she-male, and they boast and brag on having such a huge, big female. So, you know, that's why I thought, you know, let them hear some of the knowledge that you've got to give on that kind of perspective. So, you know, that that's, that's why I really wanted to cover that subject, man. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I understand. See, a lot of what's going on, and for real, um, it's like a class thing with the dogs. This is what I picked up on. And, and like, you know, so a lot of what we do is showboating and bragging because we got to be important. We want to be, you know, somebody. We want to be a part of something. And, we, you know, a lot of times what happens is with people, you know, um, um, we be pushed to the side, kind of like overlooked. You know, we don't really know our purpose. We're trying to find ourselves. So we like find validation through the dog. We're able to say, look at my dog. You know, I done did something. And then it's just uh, at the end of the day, we we valuing, we valuing the wrong thing. We're looking at materialistic. We're looking at appearance. We're looking at appearance and not really the content of the character. Right, people also, you know, making it about themselves instead of about the dogs. Yeah, that's what dog shows is all about. The dogs don't really care about nothing about medals, nothing about being involved with a whole bunch of other dogs. The dog is there serving the human, and the human is there trying to network and socialize and, you know what I'm saying, get accolades and stuff. Dog shows are for people, you know what I'm saying? And, it, and you have to understand that so I like I don't learned a lot about this behavior from living with dogs, being intertwined with the dogs. You start to learn about yourself because you study in the way that the you know this behavior the dog doesn't talk. So a lot of what you're going to get from the dog is based off of your observations. You know you got to be like listening with your eyes. You know what I'm saying? So. It teaches, it teaches, I've learned a lot from that. And that's just like uh, the shortcomings of the human beings in society, the culture. It made me want to, that's part of what I do. That's really a lot of what I do is about leading with example. You know what I'm saying? And trying to establish, you know, logical thinking where a lot of people just not really even thinking things through. They're not asking no questions. They just take what somebody else told them and then run with it. 
Like, okay, this is the way that it should be. Instead of question, not questioning a lot of stuff. Right. You know what I'm saying? Why, what, who, how? You know what I'm saying? How? Why is that like that? Why are you telling me that this is the way that it's supposed to be? And I got to go double back and check that with somebody else to make sure. You know what I'm saying? Because it's, it's so much, it's so much confusion. It's funny you say that. I'm the same way as far as like, you know, outside of the dogs. I try to teach this to my kids as far as like, you know, I always want to know, like you said, okay, well, why is this this way? Okay. And I kind of try to teach my kids too, you know, to kind of rethink, rethink things. Don't everything that you've been taught, you know, sometimes you got to rethink it and reteach yourself because those things may not be correct. Right. So, so I agree with you. Yeah, and it's the part of it's the way this society is set up. It's the capitalistic society. So we looking to, you know, over we looking to over. You know, it's like a competition. So a lot of stuff with people putting out bad information. You know what I'm saying? And, and information age. So that what they do is misinform people and they be confused. You know what I'm saying? And that's what we see. Like a lot of these dogs. I mean, if you just think about logically, with the bully, the pit bull. You come from the pit bull, and then you arrive at a bully. It's clear that they have included other breeds in order to get there. Yeah. And but then they'll tell you, "Well, this is a pure, you know, this is a pure breed." And they make it a mystery and a taboo thing, and people don't want to speak on, you know, the breeds of dogs that was mixed in. I don't know why, and it's clear to see that you did not just take. American Pitbull Terrier and American Staffordshire Terrier and selective breed those two to get to the dog you see in front of you today. Various breeds of dogs was mixed into them dogs to get to what we have. Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's nothing wrong with that. It, 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 just it, say it. <laughs> yeah. And don't be scared. Don't be scared to cross it. Like, listen, you're trying to get to a desired effect or <laughs> dog, don't be scared to, I mean, cause listen. Every breed of dog that was created had to pull from different dogs and what have you to get to the point there was that. That's why I don't know with the American bully, why they make it such a taboo thing where they don't want to talk about what dogs was added to make this dog. Yeah, it's like they secret sauce. But <laughs> I'm gonna tell you though, these guys, they, 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 they send it, I'm sending sperm to California. You know what I'm saying? I'm sending it to Arizona, sending sperm, the borbal sperm to the bully guys, right? And they creating a new right. XLs. You know what right. I'm saying? Right. And right. but I'll be telling people here, I'm like, listen, y'all, this is the secret sauce. You know what I'm saying? You gotta put something in it. You gotta, you gotta make it for that thicker bone, for whatever you're looking for, right? Yeah, you got to add something. You can't, you're not gonna get that from something that's you're not gonna get what is not there. You can't get that. It's not there. You got to add something to it. You got to bring something to it. You know what I'm saying? It's like whether it's red or merle or whatever. Temperament. Temperament. All of that. Right. You know what I'm saying? You have to. But it's like we be, uh, we want to follow instead of lead. You got to be willing to blaze the trust. You got to be willing to take some hits. You got to be right. willing to take some hits. I want to, uh, I want to speak on this, you know. I, you know, whenever I, whenever I deal with, a guest, you know, I, I like to kind of do a little bit of research. And, you know, when I was doing a little bit of research on the breed of the Borbo, I kind of came across people being decisive on the black coat color. Can you kind of break down what's the controversy behind that, man? Okay. When it come to the Borbo. Yeah, so it's, it's really controversial because what happened with the Borbo. All right, the original, but remember, we talked about the Canis, the African Canis dog, Africanis dog. And it's basically just a stray, it's a mutt. And it's brown. Look, look, think about the dingo. If you think about um, the coyote, the jackals, they all have this like a brownish, you know, where they can blend into the ground, blend right. in with the ground. So, you know, that is the original burble because it's coming from this bull master of Canis Africa mostly brown dogs, they were saying that when they created the standard, there was no black dogs. They did not have the black dogs. And remember, we talked about this commercializing of this, the dog. That was, that was because to supplement the farmer's income post-apartheid. 
right? So they had apartheid in South Africa where <clears throat> it was basically like a form of slavery or, um, you know, that they lasted all the way up until 1983. And then they said, well, look, we're about to free the slaves in 1983. And the farmer gets shook. He worried. How am I going to survive this? I need to supplement my income. This is one of the ways that we can do it. South Africa doesn't have a commercial dog breed. It doesn't have a dog that we shipping out all over the world. We have this dog that we had surviving with on our farm. Let's commercialize the breed. So then you have a certain amount of people that believe in this breed standard where this, the, it's the constitution. And it's like, you don't alter the constitution. You don't do that um, just to bring in another color to meet the market demand. You got certain people that's here that's bringing in this disqualified color and still selling it and still breeding it. So what happens over there in South Africa, they're able to manipulate politics and, you know, do certain things. To, and they worked the way they worked it in. They worked, they altered the standard and they started accepting the black bourbon. So here in the United States and abroad, people are like, wait a minute. Oh no, this is wrong. This ain't the original bourbon. Y'all making up a, a, a color, y'all including the color that wasn't there previously just to meet the market demand. And that's the controversy behind the black dog. So I believe in the black dog because I feel like inbreeding and line breeding is just going to lead to the detriment of the breed. I feel like you have to include, you know, genetics from similarly bred, similarly appearing dogs or, you know, phenotypes, similar phenotypes, separate, different genotypes. Loosen that blood up. Loosen that blood up. And then you're going to pop out with new varieties. You're going to pop out with new um, types and styles that might be preferred, that might be beneficial, that might have these different um, traits assigned to it where you can fix certain things like Easty, Westy or whatever. You also know, less health issues. Way less health issues. Remember, we talk about this Africanist dog, the stray. We talk about the native stray, the wild dingo. These dogs are surviving for centuries without the um, without dog food, without C-sections, without the vet interference, without shots, right? They surviving and thriving. They don't have dog food. They can just eat what they can come up with. So you got to keep that in mind. This whole purebred dog breeding is only uh, roughly 200 years old. But dogs have survived alongside with men for over 10,000 years. Right. And they were breeding bread out of necessity. This whole living in a lap of luxury with all of these, you know, this we don't even worry about getting food. We know we got food, right? But back in the day, we had to hunt. So your dog was an asset. You know, he ate it in the hunt. He might flush out game. You see what I'm saying? We arrive at purebred dogs out of the luxury of a free time, you know, because people have free time and they're like hanging out. They ain't got nothing else to do. And then on Sundays, the ladies, the wives would come on and they would socialize and they would have dog shows. They would, that's how the invention, that's how the dog shows came about from people um, not having nothing else to do with their pets. And then they hook up on Sundays. And then they say, well, this is the, you know, our dogs is hanging out. And that was the first dog shows. And you know, then they started to write standards based off of what they had at their own yard. You know what I'm saying? So this, I'm saying, well, this is a um, exotic warble. And I said exotic warble should be tall, exotic warble should be long, exotic warble should be, have this much neck and this much head. And then that, I write a definition. I write a definition of the, uh, hold on, let me see who this is. You What's good. up, bro? Everything okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. Because oh, I'm in the middle of something. I just wanted to make sure that everything was cool. Okay, we're going to bring the doors out in a minute. I'll hit you right back. All right. Yeah, no, I had to. No, no worries, man. This, this 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 platform over here, we raw and we uncut. We okay, yeah. Real, though. Yeah, you know, you get them certain we, calls. We, you want to make sure everything is yeah, cool. Nah, you know what I'm saying? Good, man. Yeah. Good. Um, I want to I want to briefly discuss the appraisals that you all do on the dogs. You know, I've been watching them on Mondays. You know, for everybody out there 
Y'all do it on Mondays, right? Yeah, we do it on Mondays. Check them out on Mondays. Exotic Verbals on YouTube, man. I like what they're doing over there with the appraisals. Um, kind of break down what the appraisals are and also the reason, you know, why you all perform these appraisals. So the appraisal is a visual assessment, making sure that the dog meets this visual criteria. This gives you um, a person... Uh, basically a frame of reference so you can look and say okay based off of my expert opinion i should be trying to improve my dog's angulation in the rear i should be trying to improve my dog's height i should be trying to improve my dog's thickness or width i should be trying to improve my dog's athleticism and it just gives you a, a guide in order to improve your next generation and you're able to compare this to other um, appraisals. And the way we're doing ours is live and online too. So it's much different. Previously, it was a form of, um, it was a way to, a system of checks and balances. So they're able to say, look, that dogs don't qualify in it. But the problem with that is they were, it's not fair. And it's like I said, it's a visual appeal. And, that, and they're not necessarily telling you that. So they try to use it as a way to establish value. The South Africans will say, well, y'all trying to get the real borble, y'all trying to get the original borble. Y'all got C's. Y'all got C borbles and B borbles. Y'all need to get these A's. We got all the A's. Y'all got to gotta bring the A's in from South Africa. Right? So they lead people to believe that somehow the dogs that they bring in from South Africa are better. It's the same dogs that, that you have here. How could they be better? It's the same dogs. And it's just the, so that was my issue with it. Then, and so we start doing them on our own. You know what I'm saying? There is no way for you to scale up here in the United States to become an appraiser, you know, under the sort of a, or organization. They don't, they're not allowing it. It's a system of checks and balances to make sure that the power remains in South Africa. To make sure that people is constantly buying those because you got remember this is extremely lucrative you're talking about a 20 to 1 exchange ratio so a five thousand dollar dog here is a hundred thousand dollars in south african rands so you're talking about a huge income booster if you breed in and sell in warbles in south africa and if we if we have the better dogs here or we have the better testing systems because remember, South Africa is still kind of behind the times in terms of advanced technologies and, you know, modern civilized society. Right. So, you know, they don't have the health testing. They don't have the whole, you know, everything is not as advanced. It is not like the industry standards. It's still somewhat, you know, primitive or third world in terms of um, not knocking them. This day, they're a little bit behind the rest of the world, well, not the rest of the world, but like uh, the European nations. And uh, so they have to, they, this, this is the system. So we're doing our own because we feel underserved by the, uh, we feel underserved. And this is our way of establishing value and giving people a visual um, representation of their breed, of their dog, and then they're able to compare it. So we're doing it online. And then you can show other people that and the other people can see what you have or don't have or what you're looking for, what you're trying to improve. It's not so much in secrecy. It's not done in private. So not to cut you off, do these appraisals that you all do, is it people coming to you all and saying, hey, here my dog, this is my dog, can you all do an appraisal on it? Yeah, that's how I go. That's how, how I so, get yeah, selected. We, yo, yeah, you hit us up. Sign up through the United Borbo Club, and then you you know fill out your dog's pedigree information, submit some pictures and some videos, and that's just a, a preliminary evaluation. You know we still gonna do them in person. We gonna have big dog shows. We got dog shows coming up. That's the long term, the long goal is the big dog shows where we involve in a lot of the big dogs and bringing in you know Presley Canaries, Connie Corsos. English Master, Bull Master, Rottweilers, Dogos. For the people out there, you got a show coming up in September, right? 
Yeah, uh, we got a show coming up in September. Yep. Let, 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 let people out there that may be watching this, you know, get them the information on the show and where it's going to be located. So it's the Alpha Dog Showdown. It's coming up in Virginia, Hampton, Virginia. And it's we're putting it on for all the big dogs, bringing out the big dogs. We want to see what you got. We want to see what you're working with. This is going to be a, a publicity. It's going to be a big publicity for you. We're working with the public. We're going to try to bring out some celebrities or whatever. Anybody that's in, interested in this big dog class of dogs that's actually, um, you know, valued, performing, functional dogs. We just, it's just a platform to showcase your, your breed, your big dog. If you got a big dog, bring it out. We want to see it. Corsos, we know y'all out there. We know y'all representing, y'all got y'all bringing out some real Corsos, some real Corsos in the United States on the East Coast. We want to see them. The presses, y'all say that y'all got some of the toughest working dogs, some of the best working dogs. Bring them out. Show and prove. I say the Bourbon can hold his own weight against any of the breeds, right? So I feel like the Bourbon was the best. We want to show and prove, but it's a really, it's not so much of a competition, but it's more of a community. I mean, we're trying to get everybody out, hang out, and let's celebrate the dogs. Let's celebrate the big dogs. It's just an open platform for the big dogs, XL bullies. We want to see y'all out there, the English Massive, the Rottweilers, the Dobermans, the Great Danes, anything that's big. Even if it's small, we just want to celebrate the dogs, you know, and have a community-based event where everybody is able to participate. All right. Um, what what's, what kind of qualifications, you know, do somebody need to have to be able to, you know, be in a position to perform those appraisals on those dogs? Yeah, so the appraisal thing is wide open, right? So it's uh, you should have some experience with the dogs. You should, you should have, um, you know, I think in order to become an appraiser, you have to have a, so many dogs that you have been appraised or you have birthed so many dogs. And then you have to study up under a senior appraiser. And, you know, it's just a lot of different little steps. But you should take an appraiser's course. Okay. And, I mean, you have to have a good working knowledge of the dogs. You gotta have a good understanding of the conformational breed standard. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, but see there, there again, we got another moving target, right? So what they do is they say, okay, well, we're gonna have a breed, appraisal's breed course, but it's not in their best interest to really have an appraiser in the United States because we could be doing appraisals at all times. So then they say, oh yeah, you gotta do this and you gotta do that. Then once you do all of that, then they say, well, you forgot to do this, and then you got to do that. And it's just a, a floating goal. And, and it ends up with being, you know, very select few or, you know, my own crew. Because you got to remember, this is about control. Right, right. Um, I want to say, you know, congratulations on the new registry. You just recently had a new registry come into effect, correct? Yeah, we, yeah. So... The North American Bourbon Breeders Association, they collapsed. Okay. Yeah. And so it's kind of a long story, but I'll try to give you the short and sweet. I'll go to a dog show down there in Cincinnati. And when I pull up, you know, I pop out, I'm taking pictures. Of, you know what I'm saying? My dog show is a dog. It, my dog is a show in itself. Right. And then I'm, you know what I'm saying? I'm doing my thing. You see what I'm saying? So right. I'm out there, I'm kicking it. And we doing the dog show in the parking lot. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so I approach the table, they got trophies. I want to know what's going on with the trophies. How do I get award? They like, listen, you have to leave. <laughs> and I'm like, who? This is a dog show for Borble? This is a Borble, this is appraisal. It's appraisal. And I'm like, who? What? For what? I haven't done anything. Right. You know what I'm saying? What? How? How do you? What make you think that you could just tell me to leave? I'm from East Cleveland. You gotta right. kick me out. Right. You gotta call the police. You right. know what I'm right. saying? Right. You cannot just. Right. You can't just tell me to leave. And I haven't. I, I can see if I had broken rules. Right. I hadn't broke no rules. So what I do is I go back to my show and I started calling in the validity of their organization. I started saying, "Look, y'all ain't no real organization. You got one person that's shot calling, and it's a monopoly. It's a dictatorship." It's not a real organization. You don't have no bylaws. Where is your charter? Where's all of this money that you made? I can see that you made money 
your results showing that you made money. I just call it you you saying that you're collecting DNA. What are you comparing it against? See, that's a whole nother. It's a lot of different uh, like schemes to make money in the dog game. So they say DNA. But for real, for real, what are you comparing this against? What are you comparing this against in order to be able to say to classify this dog as a purebred? Because they just started collecting DNA in 2009. So right. what are they comparing that DNA against? You can't establish breed purity from a DNA test. Right. That's just a fact. But they're collecting DNA and charging people for it. I'm like, y'all, that's bogus. And I started waking people up. And I started telling people, so what happens is they just went ahead and closed and dissolved. <laughs> so you set them down, baby. <laughs> yeah, they had to get up because they was faking us out. They was faking people out. So now we have a, the new, or, you know, it's it really something that I've always been doing anyway, just the dog club where we all hang out and celebrate our dogs, hang out with our dogs, you know, and, you know, this dog, you know, like, I might not, for real, for real, man, I can't even, I don't even talk this much, right. but I can talk about dogs because this is what I, you know, I'm into the dogs, so I can hang around dog people, right. you know, like, we, we can talk, and have, but we might not be able to have a whole conversation about, you know, uh, young boy versus deep, yeah, you know right, what I'm saying? Right, <laughs> I don't right. know nothing about yeah, that, yeah, right. so I can't even, you know what I'm saying? Or LeBron versus Kobe. I can't talk with you like this right. about that. You know what I'm saying? So we could talk about those. I, and I, that's what I want to do, dog community stuff. I like dog people. I hang out with dog people. And I hang out with dogs. You know what I'm saying? So it's a need. And then uh, it's a way for us to just be, you know, hang out with our dogs. We can go show somewhere. When we, when we represent, when we step out Cleveland, we polished. Right, we we done already rehearsed. We done got our reps in, so it's crisp, and we ain't looking like no amateurs. You know what I'm saying? We highly like, damn, that's a whole nother class of dog man right there. You know what I'm saying? When they come down, you know what I'm saying? When the when when my exotic verbal family, you know, when we come down, it's polished. All the dogs is sharp. You know what I mean? In shape, worked out, fed well, and that's what that's what it's about for me. And then so now. It kind of it done put me in like a under the spotlight on a really on a global thing. So I have to do this. Like I said, all these things that I be saying, like it, a lot of people start listening, and it's like now I done put myself under the spotlight, force myself into the role of. A, I be seeing you, man, putting in a lot of work for that horrible breed, man. Like I said in the beginning. I, I watch what you got going on and I be seeing like I when when I like I said I like to do research on people and when I when I when I got on your channel I just went down a, a tunnel. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, for real, I just went down a tunnel and just start to watching so many different videos and I just noticed the work ethic that you put in for that breed, man. And like I said, I I, I gotta congratulate you. You're doing a good job. Man. Thanks, bro. Yeah, I'm really just working hard at it. You know, that's my thing. All right. Um, before we get out of here, you know, where can the people find you on all social media platforms? Um, is that at Borbo's on use YouTube, Instagram? Is a Borbo Breeder International? I'm on Twitter, Borbo Breeder. I'm on Facebook, Borbo Breeders Ohio. Is that at Borbo's? And then you know, you could always Google me. I'm on Google, exotic borbos, borbopuppy.com. And, um, you know, really, I'll just be with the dogs, man. You know, somewhere, so if something going on with dogs, then you probably can find me there. All right, man. I want to say, you know, I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, you know, we can only cover so much on one show so hopefully you know in the future i can get you back on and we can you know talk more dogs um like i said i appreciate you man thank you most definitely on. bro yeah thank you for having me you know i'm honored to be here you know and I'm, I'm uh supportive of what you got going on i want to see it i want to see it reach this highest peak and get you know take all the way off and um you know like i, I want to support the rest of the bully community the cleveland community everybody that's here you know what i'm saying the dog trainers and the, my board uh, my bully buddies and my verbal buddies and 
You know, I feel like it's a positive thing. You know, we want to educate people and have to give people insider, um, you know, just give them an insider view of what it's really like. Because I think, you know, a lot of times we just get, we be being misled and thinking that this is all peaches and cream. Right, right. It's all sweet and there's flowers. They're not, they're not, you have to really, you got to get it from somebody that know it's a lot of work. Right. But if you don't mind the work, then you can have some great success. Yeah, I want to say, you know, the name of the channel is Ally Bullies TV, but we aim to bring on anybody with any breed of dog because I feel like, you know, like having you on the day, you breed borbles. It's something that these bully breeders can actually hear and listen to from people that breed other breeds and kind of learn things from these people and bring those techniques and bring that knowledge into the bully breed to refine and make that breed better. Right. Yeah. I'm for that, bro. I'm so for that, that. that. That's why I like to bring other people along that breed other breeds. You know? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's a dog. Exactly. We could all learn a little bit from each other's experience. You know, we get the lesson without the lump, as they say. All right. Ally Bullies TV. And we out of here like yesterday. Much love, bro. This episode of Allied Bullies TV is being brought to you by K9 Super Supplements Puppy Formula. This awesome supplement contains green tripe, goat's milk, biotin, along with six other ingredients to promote growth and development, support immunity, digestive health, bone health, and also skin and coat health. Head on over to K9SuperSupplements.com today and grab yours.